Um, so yeah, we'll go through a few topics and then we'll run through the problem sets. Um, so combinatorics is counting, obviously. Um, and you can think about it as counting how many elements are in a particular set with a particular definition. Um, so all combinatorics problems can be framed as problems about the, the cardinality or the size of different sets. Um, so one important uh, technique that we can use in combinatorics is um, writing one set as uh, a Cartesian product of multiple sets. And what I mean by this is, um, I'll explain it with the example. So there's five, five types of meat we can put on the pizza, four types of vegetables and six kinds of cheese. Um, and you can only choose one of each. So we have a set of types of meat and a set of types of vegetables and a set of types of cheese. And we want to choose one element from the Cartesian product of these sets. Um, that is, we want to have a triplet of food types where the first type is a meat, the second type is a vegetable, the third type is a cheese. Um, so we want to find the cardinality of the Cartesian product of these three sets. Um, and we know what the cardinalities of the individual sets are. So we can just multiply them. So um, another useful thing for counting is if you know, if you want to find the size of a set, you can reduce it to the size of a different set whose size you know. Um, so um, every car in Australia is going to have a steering wheel and every steering wheel is attached to a car, um, if it's a car steering wheel. So that's an example of a bijection. It's a mapping between two different sets where um, you're pairing up the elements such that no element from set A is paired with multiple elements from set B. Um, and no element from set B is paired up with multiple elements from set A. And every element has a corresponding pair in the other set. Um, so the set of all cars and the set of all car steering wheels would be an example. The set of all driver's licenses and the set of all steering wheels might not be. Um, because you might have multiple drivers sharing a car. Um, and the set of all positive integers and the set of all positive even integers, well, if you take the set of all positive integers and you double it, you double each element, you end up with the set of all positive even integers. Um, and you can reverse that um, by halving each even integer and you get back to a unique positive integer. So those two infinite sets also have the same size. Um, and that's an example of infinitary combinatorics. Um, and so if, if we have two sets which have a bijection between them, um, we say their cardinalities are the same. And if they're finite, then we can count how many elements in them. And we say that their cardinality is the number of elements. Um, but the more general idea of cardinality is it's a group of sets where you can bijack between any two of them. So a practical application of this um, would be in a question like this. You have three kinds of pizza and you want to eat seven slices and you don't care about the order you eat them in, you just care how many of each type of pizza do you eat. Um, so if you want to reframe this in terms of a question about the size of a different set, um, you can take out seven paper plates or paper napkins and put the slices on them and lay them out in a row on the table. Um, and because order doesn't matter, you might want to arrange them in a particularly nice order. Um, so you might arrange them with the pepperoni first and then the cheese, and then the vegetarian pizza. Um, and
and you can put empty pizza boxes or some other kind of divider between them. So if you picture seven different plates, you're kind of cutting the row of plates at each place where you change from um, pepperoni, pepperoni, pepperoni to cheese, cheese, cheese. At each change, you want to put a divider. Um, and that way you, you end up with nine objects. And the order, the, so you have nine positions on the table, I guess, which each of these objects sit in. Um, and seven of the objects are plates and two of them are dividers. So now you're really just asking, where do I put the dividers? Um, and if you think about it, the place where you put the dividers uniquely determines which kind of pizza you have, because we've specified that pepperoni comes first and then cheese and then vegetarian. Um, and it's also the case that if you have some selection of pizza, you have a unique position for both of the dividers. Um, so this problem, we can reduce it to the problem of choosing two places out of the nine to put the dividers on the table. Um, and we can answer that just by evaluating nine choose two, which is 36. All righty. Um, am I able to annotate this real quick? Sorry. Yes, I am. Perfect. All right. So uh, you may have noticed the nine choose two in the previous slide. So if you're not familiar with it, it's called the choose function. And this function is based on, we have some set and some integers k. Um, and the formal definition has to do with some kind of set size. So it's a subset of the power set. Uh, next slide, is it delayed? Yeah, there we are. So this here is our power set. And we're saying it's defined as all subsets of n, which is any element of the power set, such that the size of it is equal to k. So if we had, say, one, two, three, four, five, and we wanted to, say, five, choose three, right? Then we would be looking at how many different ways we can choose three elements. So we could choose one, two, and three. That's a subset. We could choose maybe four, one, six. Well, we can't choose six because six isn't a thing. Uh, two, right? Four, one, two, uh, which is exactly the same as two, one, four. So this choose function here has no kind of indication about order. You'll be looking at permutations if you want order in particular. Um, but yeah, so we're looking at how many different ways we can choose a certain number of elements from a larger set, which is where the name choose function comes from, right? And this choose function has a bunch of different properties. So we have uh, first one is symmetry. There we are. So symmetry. Um, I'm not going to go over the intuition for these just because if you take a look at the problem set that we'll get to later, um, part of this is kind of understanding the symmetry behind them. It's much more instructive to kind of come up with the understanding behind these from first principles. So we have symmetry, which is if you have a set of size n and we choose subsets of size k, that's the same as taking a set of size n and choosing subsets of size n minus k, right? The next one is called Pascal's rule, which if you're familiar with the Pascal triangle is the rule behind creating that, uh, which is that n choose k is equal to n minus one choose k minus one plus n minus one choose k. We have the binomial theorem, which if you've done HSC mathematics, particularly like extension one, extension two, you're probably quite familiar with the binomial theorem because it shows up quite a bit in the HSC, um, which just relates this choose function to the coefficients of an expansion of a power of two terms of a binomial, hence binomial theorem. Uh, and finally, we have the hockey stick identity, which is kind of funky. Um, but basically it's just n plus one choose k plus one can be written out as a sum of terms where the top and the bottom are of a kind of lower number. So k plus one here becomes k and the n plus one gets split into one or k up to n, right? Cool. Um, so we can look at, so yeah, I don't really have much else to say on the choose function. So we'll go over the intuitions in the, worksheet problem sets. Um, 
but there's something called the inclusion exclusion principle, which shows up a lot in kinds of questions where you're choosing things, hence it's immediately after this. But we have some kind of question where we can show where inclusion exclusion comes from. So we have a delivery driver, uh, they're absent minded, and they have n pizzas to deliver to n different addresses. And we're asked how many ways they can deliver the pizza one to each address so that no pizza is delivered to the correct address because they're absent-minded, obviously. Um, so we can call a pizza that gets delivered to the correct address a fixed point, And that terminology comes from discussing permutations. And we can let P be the set of all permutations. So all different ways you can take those n pizzas and deliver them uniquely to different addresses. And PJ be the set of all permutations where J gets correctly delivered. So where J, is a fixed point basically. So we want to, the question then is how many different ways can we deliver them with no fixed points, which means we're looking at permutations with no fixed points, right? And if we write this out, it's going to be the number of ways you can deliver them in total minus the number of ways you can deliver them where at least one address has been correctly delivered, right? So that's where the union comes from. If we have a pizza, if we have one that's delivered correctly to address one and address two, then it would be in P1 and P2, right? So these do have a little bit of overlap, which is why inclusion exclusion kind of comes about. So if we think about what this is more generally, we could write this as kind of like a big union, right? So the size of P is going to be n factorial. That is the number of different ways you can permute n different pizzas so that they go to specific addresses. And then this union here is something that we don't really know how to calculate. It isn't as simple as just taking each of the p1 value, p2, p3, so on and so forth, adding them all together or anything like that, because there is this kind of overlap between p1 and p2 possibly, right? Uh, so yeah, so this is the n factorial from the number of permutations, and this is kind of what we want to look at, right? So the question then becomes, what is this value here? What is the size of this big union? Yeah? Next slide. Okay, so I'll get rid of my annotations. Okay, so we have the principle of inclusion exclusion for two sets. So two sets is relatively simple. It is that if we take the union of two sets, the size of that's going to be A, plus B minus A and B, right? And that comes about because you could have some kind of overlap, right? You could have maybe a set here, one, two, three, and then a set down here that's like two, four, five, right? And the union of those is one, two, three, four, five, which has size five. The size of this is three, the size of this is three. And if you add them together, you get six, but you need to take away one because there is this kind of overlap here. You have double counted the twos. So this double counting means that we have to remove the intersection, right? So for two, it's relatively straightforward. And if you rearrange that, you'll get the other one, which is the intersection is the same as you just add them together and then subtract the union. Now, when we come up to three sets, it gets a little bit more complicated because now if we were to take, say, just A union, B union, C, right? and get the size of that. If we take A plus B plus C and we subtract off the intersection, A and B and C, we don't exactly get what we want. The reason being, what we've effectively done is we've counted A, we've counted C, so we're starting to get this double counting, and we've counted B. So we've double counted this, we've double counted this, we've double counted this, and we've actually triple counted what's in the middle here. So what we can instead try to do is take out these little bits in here, the little, so in this case, it would be like A intersect B. So we get say A whoop, plus B plus C, and then we start taking away the intersections. We take away A and B, take away B and C, and we take away A and C. So that looks kind of similar to our principle of inclusion exclusion for two sets. The only problem now is we triple counted this section in the middle. And by taking away all of these, we've actually completely removed it. So the section in the middle here hasn't been counted at all. So we actually need to add it back on. 
and oopsies, that should be an intersection, right? So this here is our inclusion exclusion for three sets. And you can kind of start to see a pattern continue from here. So if we continue the pattern, we end up getting the more general inclusion exclusion for any number of sets. So let's think about clearing that. So let's think about kind of the pattern that we were getting. So if we start off with the union of all, say, n sets in general, then we wait. Yep. Then we can write that out as it's the union of, so we can break this up into two kind of unions, right? We can break this up into the union of the first n minus one elements and xn. And just apply our principle of inclusion exclusion for two sets to give us the union of the first ones, the second part, and then the intersection of the last two. That's just applying inclusion exclusion for two sets. That's perfectly fine. But then we start to break it down further and further and further. And each time we break it down, we start cutting down these. So this large union here will expand out into a bunch of these and some other terms, these little extra terms here. So all of these terms at the front, the sum of the set sizes come from the xn, then the next one iteration will give us xn minus one, so on and so forth. These here start to come once we start breaking this one up, right? And if we keep going on and breaking them up over and over and over again, then eventually you get this pattern where we start off with all of the um, cardinalities of the sets, then we subtract all of the pairwise intersections, then we add all of the uh, tuple, triple wise intersections, and this pattern continues. So then you'll add on, I mean, subtract off all of the four intersections, add on all the five intersections. And more generally, we can write this as just the union. The size of the union is we take every subset and we intersect the subset within a cardinality. So we're finding the cardinality of these intersections. And this negative one out the front just gives us the kind of flip-flopping. So we start off with a plus, the next term would be negative, the next terms would be positive, right? Because if this is even, then we want a negative. So if that S there is even, then we get a negative. And if the S there is odd, we get a positive. So this is the general form of inclusion exclusion for any number of sets. Cool, which is kind of ugly. Um, so the answer to our question then is n factorial minus this extremely large thing. So normally for like two, three, a small number of sets, this doesn't get too bad. But once you start getting into larger sets with more, you kind of have to start looking at symmetries. So for this question in particular, the way we're doing everything is very symmetrical. You can switch houses, you can switch things in the permutation, nothing really changes, right? So most of these intersections here won't actually be distinct. So the intersection between say P, the size of P1 intersect P2 would be the same as the intersection of P2 and P3, right? And this is true for any number of intersections. So whenever you're dealing with inclusion exclusion, especially for one of the kind of larger ones or one where you've got a lot of items, so you're counting a very large amount of items, you will probably be leveraging symmetry over kind of anything else or over just trying to bash your head against this and calculate anything yourself. Cool. Okay, so I'm moving on to double counting. So double counting is quite a common technique in combinatorics uh, where you have one thing you want to count and there's often more than one way of approaching uh, how to count it. And what you can do is equating expressions for two different ways of counting the same thing. Uh, it can often reveal more information that can help you solve the problem. So let's have a look at this example. So we have a maths workshop where each person knew exactly 22 other people or any pair of people X and Y who knew each other. Uh, there was no other person uh, whom they both knew. And also for any pair X and Y of people who didn't know each other, there were exactly six extra people who both of them knew. And the question asks how many people were, were at the workshop. Okay. 
So this question, we're going to double count this special object, uh, which we'll call a V, uh, which is a V shape. Okay, so if you have a person here, a person here, and a person here, and let's say we draw an edge to represent people that know each other, and we will not draw an edge to represent people who don't know each other. So this is a, a graph theory interpretation of the question. So a V will represent three people where uh, two pairs of them know each other, but uh, this, but there's one pair of people who don't know each other. So what we'll do is count the number of Vs in two different ways. So since the question asks how many people were at the workshop, we can uh, use N to represent that variable, which we can we'll eventually solve for. Okay. So each, so if you look at each vertex, Since every person knew 22 other people and we, we represent each person with a vertex, there'll be 22 segments coming out from each, each person. Okay. So now to count the number of we's uh, that where, let's say in this case, this middle person is the, you can say is the root of the V or it's where the V stems from. So we can count uh, the number of V stemming from a particular person. And since, there's, since each person has 22 segments coming out of it, to choose, we have to choose two different segments to make our V. So for example, we can choose uh, this segment over here and this segment over here and that will give us a V. So the number of ways of choosing two different segments to stem out from a person will be 22 choose two and that is 231. And so this is the number of V's stemming out from each person and note that uh, we'll count every V exactly once because uh, every single V only has one person at the center of it. So uh, this person, for example, is not at the center of the V. And yeah, so is this person, this is not the center of the V. Uh, so every V has a unique center view. Uh, this will account for every V when we go through each, every single person. Okay, so I'll go to the next. Okay, so since we get a, uh, since we get 231 unique Vs from every person, uh, then for all N people, when we tally the num total number of Vs together, we will get 231 times N. Okay, so I'll go to the next. Okay. So now, now what we'll do is for every person, uh, we'll add the degrees of each vertex. So Degrees is just the number of people a particular person knows. And since every person has degree 22, uh, when we add it for all N people, we'll get 22 N. And what you can see is uh, if we have an edge between two people, uh, let's say we for, we, for this person, we will count, we're going to count this edge as part of that person's degree. But if you look at this person, you'll also also count the same edge uh, for that person's degree. So it means that every edge will be counted twice. So if you want to find the total number of edges, we can divide we can divide the 22n by two. And yes, uh, so this is also called the handshaking lemma. So the total number of edges in a graph will be the sum of the degrees uh, of every vertex and then divided by two because we double counted the edges. Okay, so I'll go to the next one. Okay, so now we can have a look at the total number of edges not present. So the total, uh, 
total number of ways of choosing a pair of people from all the all the n people is going to be n choose two. And if we subtract the number of edges that are present uh, amongst those n people, uh, we'll be left with n choose two minus 11n, which will give us a number of edges that are not present in a pair of people. Okay, so. Um, okay, so if we use the information uh, for any pair of people X and Y who didn't know each other, there are six people who both of them knew. So what this means is, uh, let's say we have two people over here who didn't know each other. Uh, it means there's six people, six people that form V's like this. So for every pair of people that did, didn't know each other, we can find six V's that look like this. So this allows us uh, to find another way of calculating total number of V's. So remember, for every V, we can find the two people that don't don't know each other, and uh, because of that, for all n choose two minus eleven n pairs of people that don't know each other, we will get a unique v. So what this means is we can find a second way of counting the number of v's. So if we go to the next uh, dot point, we will the total number of v's will be six times inches two minus 11 n because there'll be six v's for every pair of people that don't, don't know each other and six so we can do six times the number of edges not present to uh, give us another way of finding the total number of v's and so if we go to the next uh, next dot point we'll okay so the previous expression for a number of these uh, we derived earlier was 231 n and the second expression is the new expression we found for a number of these so this is good because using our double counting uh, we have an equation with just n on each side now uh, n choose two is going to be n times n minus one over two and so we will get a quadratic equation that involves n and if we solve the quadratic equation will eventually get uh, n equals 100. Uh, so that's in the next uh, dot point. So there's going to be two integer solutions, but one of them uh, will probably fail because of uh, them being negative, for example. So we only end up with one solution, which is n equals 100. That's, that's a double counting in, in action. So this is in a graph theory context. So I think the hard part of this question was figuring out that double counting V's is quite useful. And the double counting V's turn out to be useful because the V's enables us to use the information that every person has a degree 22 and also helps us use the fact that for every pair of people that don't know each other, uh, we can find six V's that so that's why we were able to find the V's in two different ways. Okay, so that's, yeah, that concludes double counting. And now we'll move on to the combinatorial reciprocal principle. Great. Uh, Thanks, you, Sarah. Um, hopefully that all made sense. Um, so the combinatorial reciprocal principle, um, it doesn't come up too often, but I think it's worth mentioning just because it's a, a bit different. Um, so the basic idea is we have some coloring on a set S, um, and this, this coloring we can represent with just a function from S to the integers of another set. Um, and we want to count how many points in the set have the same color as a particular point um, or have a particular color. So we'll say LJ is the set of all points with the color J. Um, and 
so if we think about the the sum of the reciprocals of the number of points that are the same color as a given point, um, then if we sum up all these reciprocals, we'll get the total number of colors used in the coloring. Um, and the reason for this is when you, when you look at this first sum here, um, you're summing over the elements of the set um, and you're counting, so this L of F of K is counting how many elements in the set have the same color as this element. Um, and if we reframe it as summing up across the colors, um, we sum up across the colors, but we have to weight the sum by this numerator here, um, the number of elements that have that color. Um, so we kind of, if you think about it that way, it's almost trivial that we end up with um, the left-hand side being equal to the right-hand side, but it does turn out to be useful um, in some questions. So let's look at this one. We have students grouped into 13 different country groups and five different age groups. Um, and we want to show that at least nine students had more students in their age group than students from their country. So um, you can see that we're asking a question about the number of elements from the set of students in each of the categories. Um, so we'll say S is the set of students um, and A is the, the age group coloring um, and C is the country group coloring. Um, so we'll say A of J is the number of students in age group J and C of J is the number of students from country J. Um, so then we can think about, well, we can calculate um, each of these separately. Um, the sum of reciprocals of the number of students in a particular, um, in, in the same country as a given student minus the sum of the reciprocals of the number of students who are the same age as a given student. Um, and we know what this difference is because we can calculate each of them individually. There's 13 countries, so the first term is 13. And there's five age groups, so the second term is minus five. Um, so we end up with this equation um, in terms of the difference of the reciprocals for each student um, and just eight. So we know that that's eight. Um, and since we know this sum is eight, well, each of these terms can be positive or negative, but they can't be more than one because um, the number of elements in C and the number of elements in A is going to be a positive integer. Um, so their difference can't be bigger than one um, because their reciprocals are positive integers. So we need, um, if, if they're negative, they don't contribute to getting us to eight. Um, if they're um, positive, then they're less than one. Um, so we need certainly more than eight positive terms in this sum um, for the total to be eight, um, which means we need more than eight students for which um, the terms in the sum add to more than zero. Um, and this is, it's a little bit like the pigeonhole principle, which we covered in a workshop last term. Um, but we can see that there's this constraint on the number of, uh, that this, this constraint on the set of different 
sum ends in the sum. Um, and that tells us that at least nine of them are bigger than zero, which implies that um, the reciprocal of the elements in C, the same country, is bigger than the reciprocal of the students in the same age group, which means that the students in the same age group, um, there's, there's more students in the same age group than students in the country of that particular student. Um, and we know there's at least nine students for which this is true, which is what we wanted to demonstrate. Um, does anybody have any questions about this proof, this question, this principle? Cool. All right. Um, so now we'll talk about recurrence relations. Um, and we're going to use this example of balanced bracketings. Um, so balanced bracketings means that whenever you, a balanced bracketing is a bunch of brackets where each open bracket has a closed bracket corresponding to it after that. Um, after the open bracket. So these are three examples of bracketings that are balanced. Um, this left bracket pairs with this right one. This left one pairs with this right one. Um, this left bracket pairs with this right bracket. And this left bracket pairs with this right bracket. Um, whereas the the fourth example here is not a balanced bracketing because if you look at the third bracket along, it's a closed bracket with no corresponding opening bracket. Um, and the question we want to ask is if we have four left brackets and four right brackets, how many ways can we arrange them where the back, the brackets are balanced? Um, so if we think about reducing this case with four types of each bracket to the, 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 the relevant answer for three brackets, two brackets, one bracket, zero brackets. Um, that's a recurrence relation. We want to write this answer to the question about four brackets in terms of the answer to other questions about other numbers of brackets. Um, so we'll say that CN in general is the number of ways you can have N left brackets and N right brackets where they're balanced in this way. Um, and we'll call this balanced string of brackets with N pairs and N bracketing. Um, so one observation we can make is if you have the first initial bracket, um, that first bracket has to be closed by some second bracket. But in between the first bracket and the bracket that closes it, you can have any kind of balanced bracketing. Um, and after the first bracket is closed, you can have another balanced bracketing. Um, so we've reduced this problem to, we've reduced the number of brackets that we need to consider in the problem by one. Um, but now we need to consider all the ways that you can have a balanced bracketing inside and also outside the first pair of brackets. Um, so since we've reduced the number of brackets we're considering by one, we need the number of brackets um, inside and outside to add to n minus one. So j plus k plus one is n. Um, and because of the, the factorization principle we discussed before, um, the number of ways to have a j bracketing inside and a k bracketing outside, because they're independent, 
we just multiply the number of ways you can do it for each j and k. Um, and because we have this restriction on j and k, we can write j in terms of n and k. Um, and I've re-indexed re -indexed this here to be n plus one instead of n, just because it makes things simpler on this side. Um, otherwise, you'd have j is n minus one minus k in here, and n minus one up the top here, and n here. Um, but in general, this is the recurrence relation for this question. Um, and because we're only considering four, which is a pretty small number, um, and we have this recurrence relation, we can reduce the case for four into this sum of lower terms. Um, and so we end up with these three equations for four, three, two pairs of brackets. Um, and if you think about the case for one pair of brackets and zero pairs of brackets, in each case, there's only one way to do it. Um, in the case for one pair, it's just a left and a right. And in the case for zero brackets, it's just an empty string. Um, so if we take this and we plug it into here, we can see that C2, the number of bracketings with two pairs is two. Um, and then we move one up and we see that C3 has five different ways of pairing the brackets. Um, and for four pairs of brackets, we can write this in terms of C0, C1, C2, and C3. Um, and we end up with 14 as our final answer. Um, does anybody have any questions about that general approach? This is quite similar to how um, some integrals are evaluated uh, in some of the introductory math courses here. Um, so you should be familiar with this general approach. Great. Okay, um, so now we'll run with the same question and we'll kind of generalize it a little bit. Um, and the, the way we're going to generalize this, it's, I would say it's a more advanced technique, but it can be used to solve a lot of sequence questions, um, especially involving recurrence relations, where you want to find a general formula for the terms of the sequence. Um, so a generating function is pretty much you take the information, you take the terms of a sequence and you put all that information inside an infinite polynomial where the first term is the coefficient for the constant term. The second term is the coefficient for um, the linear term. The third term is the coefficient for the quadratic term and so on. Um, so we'll do this for Cn um, and this sequence Cn the balance bracketings problem bijects to a lot of other problems. Um, so we call these the Catalan numbers in general. Um, that's where this C comes from. And if you look them up on Wikipedia, you'll see a bunch of different examples where these get used to count uh, the number of configurations of different setups. Um, so we'll take our recurrence relation and when I see this k and this n minus k here, I'm kind of reminded of um, expanding multinomials, expanding squares and multinomials. And the reason, the reason I say that is because when you expand a square of some sequence, um, some polynomial, well, for each term, you need to multiply two different coefficients. Um, you need to multiply, say, let's, let's think about the x squared term. 
Um, if you want to get x squared as a product of powers of x, there's a few different ways to do that. You can write x squared is x squared times x to the zero, or x to the one times x to the one, or x to the zero times x to the zero. And in fact, if we jump back here to our specific case, this to me looks kind of like the expansion of a square of a polynomial. Um, so when we apply um, the generating functions technique, we, consider, we can consider the, the square of this infinite polynomial, and we can look at particular terms of this generating function, um, of the square of the generating function. Um, so if you expand this out, you'll see that for the x to the n term, you want um, this constant term times the coefficient of x to the n because the powers of x for each of those add up to n. Um, and you want the, the x to the 1 coefficient times the x to the n minus 1 coefficient, and so on. Um, and you'll see that this is a little bit like what happens in a binomial expansion. Um, you kind of have this, the first set of coefficients is going up, and the second set is going down. And we already know what this is. We know that this is Cn plus one just by the recurrence relation we already derived. Um, so if we want to simplify um, this square here, well, we can see that the square of the generating function is related to the generating function itself because Remember, the generating function was just Cn um, as the coefficient for each x to the n term, whereas here we have Cn plus 1 as the coefficient of each x to the n term. So we don't really like having x to the n and Cn plus 1 because that doesn't match. So we can multiply this square here by x. So then we have the x to the n minus one term has a coefficient of c n plus one. Um, and so if we compare these two, the original generating function and the, the square of the generating function shifted a long one by multiplying by x, we can see that these cancel out. Um, and what we end up with is just the C0 term, which is one. Um, so now we have this equation in terms of the square of the generating function and the generating function. Um, and this is just a quadratic equation in the generating function. So we can solve this using the quadratic formula. Um, we just end up with this expression and it has a plus minus sign in there. But if you take the plus sign and think about the limiting behavior at zero, um, you'll end up with one plus one minus zero. Um, so just two on the top and zero on the bottom. And around zero, that doesn't actually have an infinite polynomial expansion. It doesn't have a power series expansion. Um, so we need to take the negative sign. And if we take the negative sign, then at zero, you can see it's one minus one on the top and zero on the bottom. So it's zero over zero. And we do actually have a Taylor series expansion at zero of this. Um, this generating function has a well-defined limit at zero if we use this formula with the minus sign. Um, and now we want to we look at this square root here. 
Um, and we can expand this square root in terms of um, a Taylor series expansion just with the change of variable. Um, and it turns out if you crunch the numbers here, you do the algebra, which is a little bit tedious, you end up with a general formula for the generating function of the Catalan numbers. Um, and because of the way we defined the generating function of this series, you can just pull out the coefficients here if you want to get the CN term, the nth Catalan number. Um, and the nth Catalan number is just going to be 2n, choose n over n plus 1. Um, and we don't have an x, x equals 0 term here. Um, but we know what the x0 term is anyway. Um, so if you, if you go to Wikipedia and you look at the Catalan numbers, this is the general formula you'll find the excluding the x to the n, this part of the sum end is the general formula of Catalan numbers. Um, so that's all the content for this workshop. Um, but we do have a problem set um, 